The search for truth never ends. Introducing June's Journey, a hidden object mobile game with a captivating story. Connect with friends, explore the roaring 20s, and enjoy thrilling activities and challenges while supporting environmental causes. After seven years, the adventure continues with our immersive travels feature. Explore distant cultures and engage in exciting experiences. There's always something new to discover. Are you ready? Download June's Journey now on Android or iOS. Imagine what's possible when learning doesn't get in the way of life. At Capella University, our game-changing FlexPath learning format lets you set your own deadline so you can learn at a time and pace that works for you. It's an education you can tailor to your schedule. That means you don't have to put your life on hold to pursue your professional goals. Instead, enjoy learning your way and earn your degree without missing a beat. A different future is closer than you think with Capella University. Learn more at capella.edu. Subscribe on iTunes at Toddcast Podcast. Yeah, yeah. Look at that sexy motherfucker. What is up, buddy? How Fuck, it's you? been a long time, man. It it's has been a, been a minute, time. man. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm all right. You look well. Good. Does this sound okay? It sounds okay. It sounds okay. All right. Yeah. It's not your mic, but. Uh, yeah. Well, I got the blue mic, man. These guys gave me this mic about a half year back, and it's fucking deadly, man. The blue mic, eh? I've heard I've heard good things about it. Yeah, and they're cheap, man. I think they're under a couple yeah. hundred bucks. Yeah, I was gonna but, say I think they go for one fifty to two hundred or something. Yeah, like they're that. not they're not expensive. So I do have I have a Comrex machine. I could uh, I can set up. I can go get my other mixer if, unless. But if this is okay, then I can just. Uh, I mean, it sounds okay. Do you th- okay. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, it's, right. it's, it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I was, I was uh, texting with you the other day and saying uh, you were like the one of the original guests on episode number one, which is now seven years ago, dude. I can't believe you've been doing this for seven years. Right? Crazy. And you're, st- and you're still sexy after all this time. <laughs> it's the uh, shitty beard, I think, is what's helping here. Yeah, I got my, yeah, like, I, look, I got my. Oh, no, you look like drum. a pirate or something. Like, uh, no, I can almost look. curl. I, I can just eat Watch some for Seaball in the next uh, Pirates of the Caribbean movie. Take it over <laughs> for Johnny Depp there. Yeah, when it, when they go straight to DVD, <laughs> right before DVD is completely obsolete. Right. So, welcome back to the podcast, James. Uh, I, I, I guess, um, you know, the, the question on everybody's mind is like, how's the camp? How's your circle with COVID? And it just seems to be kind of manipul- mon- monopolizing uh, everybody's time, and, <laughs> you know, for the last fucking year. Interesting it's, year, hey? It's been unique, right? What, like, what are the most overused words over the last, what, 11 months? Unique, challenging, difficult, troubling, unsettling. Uh, you know what? I will say this. I, I've never appreciated where I live more than this past year. And we live in South Delta and down around Boundary Bay. We're about um, two blocks from the ocean down at the beach. And so you can kind of see through where we are. And we built planter boxes in the garden this year. And so yeah. we decided to make veggies. And um, yeah, and, and so... We, the one thing I do feel like we've got on our side is we've got space. Um, you know, there's an old school that's now a farming school about a block over from us. That's a dog park. So, you know, we can kind of run around with a dog and yeah, we're one of those millions of people that got a COVID dog. <laughs> and uh, Same. we, so we've got, we've got that going for us. And then, you know, to have the space at the beach and to kind of run along the dike, that's been kind of nice for us. Um, you know, I struggled turning into a suburbanite when I first moved back to the West Coast about eight years ago. And man, I, I this past year was a reminder that, wow, OK, I feel I feel really good about, you know, no longer being the city slicker to kind of have that space for the kids to move around. And, you know, we're, we're good, man. Like I, I, I would say, you know, for me. You know, working from home as somebody who's had to commute. Now, the downside about being a suburbanite is the commute. And so I don't miss my commute. Uh, I probably get about an hour to an hour and a half of my day back every day. Right. Um, you know, I think I think when the kids were at home all the time, not going to school last spring, that was a little more of a, you know, what the fuck? How am I going to get this done? As I'm sure everybody felt like that. Um, but I, you know, I think we've managed all right, and to have the space and 
you know, we got four kids in the house. Like we, we try to be pretty tight uh, about ours because, I, I, you know, I, I guess it, it sounds probably weird, but we kind of have a robust bubble to begin with. So between my better half, Brenda and I, you know, we kind of pulled a Brady bunch a few years ago. So her two daughters and my two daughters. So we got four girls in the house beyond just the two of us. So with all of them, and then we've got our respective exes as well. So there's my ex-wife. And so there's another one to our sort of bubble, if you will. And then, you know, uh, Bren's ex-husband and, you know, his new wife and their new child. So, you know, on a, you know, on a, on a good day, our bubble, you know, overall, uh, it's, you know, it's about 10 people, right? So not to say that we go hang out with our exes and all that, but you know, if there's peace in the Valley and, yeah, and yeah. the kids and the kids will go to the, you know, one week that my kids will be at my place. And then the next week they'll go to their moms and, you know, we're just trying to be mindful of the fact that, you know, that's, that's where we're at. So if you're bringing, or if you're exposed to anything, um, so in that sense, but I don't know about you, man, but like, you know, I, I the, limitation know of, the, the limitation of, um, so, you know, sports programs, rec programs, like I've loved having, you know, family dinners at night where, you know, for years it's been, holy crap, eat this grilled cheese sandwich, got to get out the door because you got to be at practice in 10 minutes, right? Well, we got to get up to the pool. We got to get to the soccer field. And, you know, for everything to just kind of chill the hell out, I there was an element that I kind of really like to kind of say, man, like this whole rat race thing, I get it. Life is busy at this stage of our lives, but I kind of enjoyed a little bit of the Hakuna Matata. Yeah, totally. Like if, if there's the silver lining in COVID and the pandemic, it's the family time. And actually, like ah. you say, you know, you're having dinners now and it's not a rushed world and there's just more, you know, more cuddling and watching movies. Yeah. And my you know, spoon, go, my spoon game is through the roof. Right. You know, and, and, and going like on, on hikes and stuff. I don't know if yes. you guys do that as well, but like Tons. We try to do that. And like, you know, we play road hockey, which is the only time that we truly are fucking with the bubble. We, we play road <laughs> hockey on Sundays, yeah. Yep. but it's generally the same people. And like, let's be honest, we, you know, we have kids and you know, you want to talk bubbles. Those kids have fucking no self-restraint. Right. Like they're literally, it, it's not like social distancing. They're like social climbing on each other. Like yeah. it's, there's, so once you get to that point, like, I don't know, man, fuck, I'm just ready for it to take a hike. No, I, I, I think a lot of people are done with it. And, um, yeah. you know, it, it, and it's funny because I find myself, if you see somebody at a grocery store or, uh, you know, you're out walking and you talk to somebody and, you know, you, you see the, the varying levels of people that were, are just, I am so done with this. I am dying and this is killing me and just what it's done to my headspace. And, and I'm totally empathetic of that. Right. And, you know, yeah. I, I took, so I've true. taken phone calls from my, my parents over the last year and my parents have been together for, you know, more than a half a century married and, and it's wonderful, but then they've really been serious about being mindful of, you know, of COVID, but they also live in a very rural part of Eastern Ontario. And, you know, when it's just the two of them, all the time you kind of get tired of each other's shit right like you don't have oh, yeah. that social like we didn't go up and visit this past summer my sister didn't go up with her family to visit right so it's just mom and dad and you know you you go through the gamut of the board games and you go through coronation street and you know i've taken calls from them over the last year at different times like i just need a fucking break <laughs> you know? sorry mom sorry dad for outing you and uh you know and, and that's so sort of true, element though. Yeah. And, and, so you know, when, when you're in those small bubbles and, and I'm really empathetic uh, for, for people that don't have that social network or don't, you know, if you, you live alone, if you're single and that sort of element, I, I'm sure this probably been, you know, a real kick in the ass and, and that that's really hard. And, and as somebody who's, who's been there in the past, obviously not through a pandemic, like I get it. Like I went through a divorce and, and man, it was, it was really hard on my mind going back a number of years ago, but um, at the same time, I, I some sometimes quiet in the sense that, um, you know, I work in broadcasting, so I know that like, you know, I can lose my job in any minute because, you know, there's somebody cheaper and younger and just, you know, they're, you know, restructuring, you know, it's just the media industry is going crazy. But I, at the same time, man, like this past year, I've been thankful and I, I try to keep my head down a little bit in the sense that, man, like, you know, weather is pretty good on this side of the country for the last year. Um, you know, I can stretch my legs. I mean, my biggest complaint sometimes is when it's too windy to go for a run, like 
my, I, if I'm pissing and moaning about the wind being my first world problem, then right. I feel like I'm doing okay. Like the kids have been in a good headspace, and uh, yeah, man. Like I, I, you know, honestly, like I probably get a little Zoom chat out uh, a little too much of that sometimes, but I can't complain too much about the year that we've had. Yeah, true. And you're mentioning the you know the broadcast part. You you basically been you know part of sports broadcasting in Canada for like three decades. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I, I, you know what? I started at score in the late '90s. Um, right. You know, I first came, I got out of school in '95, so I'm kind of turning into an old man, I guess. But yeah, '90s, 2000s, 2010s, and now into the, the uh, it's like fourth four. decade, man. Four, oh my baby. god! Like we're gonna be we're, the two of us are turning into like the Red Robinsons of the next generation. <laughs> oh my god! No kidding. Well, how how long have we known each other? Uh, you know, you used to come on when I was doing the afternoon show at Sea Fox. You come on oh. like. A, you know, at least once every couple of weeks, once I, a week, maybe. I, I was going to say, like, I can remember us meeting uh, at the Malone's down at like Richards and Seymour. Yeah. And that's got to be close to 20 years. Like now. It's got to be close to 20. Yeah. 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 I feel like it's, you know, been... we're playing the, the NHL hockey game. We'll, we'll get into you being the voice, the play by play <laughs> and all that. Uh, you know, the first time I, I turned it on, I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> it's James. My kids are like, Oh, you know, him? I'm like, yeah, it's like a buddy of mine he used to come on my radio show and like, how the, how to, well, let's get into how did you get that gig, man? Like there had to be tons of people applying for that, man. So for me, it was, uh, this is about three years ago. Now, um, I was doing a podcast with one of your former Toddcast podcast guests, Davis Sanchez. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So Davis, who now is uh, an analyst over at TSN. So Jesse and I were talking one day randomly because we do this podcast. So we were just always chatting. And um, he had a, a really good friend that was a producer for Electronic Arts, which is the parent company, EA Sports, the NHL video game. And just kind of mentioned that they needed a play-by-play. They were looking for a new broadcast team. Hmm. And I remember just kind of, oh, oh, Reggie. Hmm. And, mm-hmm. I said, and I said... <laughs> You know, do, do you think do you think you could ask uh, your buddy if I could get an audition? Because um, I hadn't heard about it, and he had mentioned that they were kind of running through a gamut of a number of broadcasters, and there were a number of names that I was familiar with. And I was like, man, I I just love to take a swing at the plate. And he said, yeah, I, I can ask. And a couple of days later, I I got an email from um, a member of the HR department at. Uh, electronic arts based out of Los Angeles. And they just said, Hey, look, your name's come up. Uh, we'd like to schedule an audition for you. And so I went in for the audition. And the funny thing was Hancock, I, we had won a trip to Maui for the family uh, at an event that I had been emceeing and read the winning ticket that went over well with the crowd when we were still allowed to gather. And uh, I, I, we were ready to fly to Maui that afternoon. I got off the air from Sportsnet 650 that morning, raced to the studios from downtown Vancouver to Burnaby, and then um, did my audition. And they kind of threw me a whole bunch of different uh, video clips, uh, and they just said, go for it, man. Like, it doesn't matter about getting names right and just kind of call it like you see it. And, you know, just kind of did it. And I kind of a high energy type of person to begin with and just kind of had fun with it and just kind of let myself go. And, you know, I think I heard some giggling, uh, you know, and I think a couple of times that, you know, and you, you know, when you kind of pop the room, you know, and the, the, you know, the people kind of behind the scenes and, you know, and, you know, kind of like, all right, maybe I'm doing something right here. And I remember leaving the studio and, you know, the producers and the the audio team were were all really nice. And I remember thinking to myself, man, what is this place is cool. I, I don't know what the hell just happened, but I, I think it was fun and, and then race to the, you know, race to the school to grab the kids and then off to the airport to go to Maui for a week. And, you know, and, and the timing of it, you know, I mean, you get on a beach and you're on vacation, just kind of forgot about it. And I didn't hear anything back for about a month and out of the blue, um, they, I got uh, an email just saying, Hey, you know, we've reached a short list and uh, you're still on it. So so by that time, like a month later, Yep. Do you already think like, fuck, I didn't get it. You know, a part of me had forgotten about it. And then I think it popped in my mind, like, Oh yeah, I did that audition. And then that was cool. And you know, and I remember, you know what, honestly, Todd, my thought was, I'm just happy that I, I took a shot. 
got a, got a chance to do it. Yeah, yeah. I just like, yeah. I don't care if I failed. I'm just glad, I'm glad I did it. That was honestly, I was just happy that I had that experience. And I was okay with that. On, did you hear who was on the short list? You know, they were pretty limited. Um, I heard a few names and I, I don't want, I don't want to mention it. Uh, you know, I don't want to mention some of the other names. I think there were, you know, there's, uh, I think there were broadcasters here in Vancouver. There were broadcasters, I think from Calgary, from Edmonton, from, you know, a lot of different parts of the U S as well along the West coast that they, I think my understanding was there were at least two dozen um uh, broadcasters or, or play-by-play guys and a lot of NHL voices, uh, you know, from, from all over that, that had come up for this. And so, I mean, that's the other thing. When you look at the names that have done the NHL game, it's like Jim Houston, who's been totally. like hockey date in Canada, you know, Gary Thorne, who was the voice of hockey for years for ESPN. And then, you know, Doc Emmerich, who's been the voice of hockey for NBC. Like you're talking about like three hall of fame broadcasters and, then you know you're bringing somebody else and like you got stuck with her but anyway I, I i get a message from and they said hey look we've shortlisted we'd like for you to come back and uh, do a chemistry test and so uh or no sorry they they said you know we'll, we'll let you know in the next week or so and uh we should have a decision in the next week to 10 days cool i'm like still in the game well you know another month goes by <laughs> it's like well, I guess I didn't hear back. I, I guess they went in another direction, but Hey, you know what? At least I got shortlisted. I, you know, again, it was just, I'm just happy to be nominated, just happy to be considered. Yeah. And then a month later, there was like, we'd like for you to come in for a chemistry test. And you're like, Whoa, okay, this is getting serious. And I go in and, and who do I run into in the parking lot is uh, Ray Ferraro and Ray, obviously 400 goals in the NHL and a uh, great analyst with TSN and, and, Ray and I had worked together in uh, different capacities in years past. And, you know, I'm a big Ray fan and I, they, had, you know, I kind of saw Ray and I'm like, man, I know they're big fans of yours. I mean, you've been involved in the game in years past. And he just kind of remarked to me backwards. He's like, Hey man, all I know is just keep doing what you're doing because it sounds like you really hit a home run with that audition. And I was like, Oh, okay. And so we went in and I think it went well uh, for about 15 minutes. We just kind of riffed off each other and they liked what they heard. And, we got to, uh, and then about another month later, uh, they wanted me to come in for a third audition. And that's where there was a conversation with one of the lead producers, uh, David Pritchard, who kind of laid out to me saying, look, you know, here's the deal. We really like what you can bring to this, but you're also a bit of an unknown commodity from, you know, a conventional broadcast in the sense that, you know, I think there's people that would be familiar with me in Canada, having worked here in Vancouver, having worked in Ottawa and Toronto over the years and being on, you know, on national networks, but not necessarily in a play by play capacity. And especially you know, having zero currency really in America. So they you know, said, look, you know, give us one more audition, play it a little more straight this time. And we just want to make sure we can kind of sell it to the bosses. So I went in and just briefly, and they said, you know what? I think we got what we need and um, hopefully we'll know in a week. And that was like the most agonizing week. Cause now like you want something and you're like, it's right there. And I'm just like, I want it so fucking bad. <laughs> and finally after, Oh my God. Anytime I get, there was a text, an email, a call. Is this it? Is this it? Oh my God. And uh, finally, on the uh, on the Friday, about like a full week later, I got a call from uh, Sean Ram Jagsing, who's one of the lead producers uh, for the game, and just said, "Hey, man, uh, how are you? I'm good. And, you know, I just uh, just want to let you know uh, we'd like for you to be the uh, the new voice for NHL 20." And uh, you know, and Hancock, I'm sure you'll appreciate this because you know us graybeards now uh, have been doing this for a while. You know, I've been fortunate enough to do some really cool things in my life from this career, um, but to still kind of get a moment like that, um, man, that was probably one of the most fulfilling feelings of my life, considering to grow up playing that video game as a kid and then to think to get paid to be in a video game all these years later, like all that time playing Donkey Kong and Pac-Man, it's finally paid off, brother. <laughs> That's very cool, man. Congratulations. Thank you. How, how long did it would, would roughly do you think it took you to from start to finish voicing everything from the audition or the actual game, the actual game, like getting into studio, banging it out? Yes. Yeah, so, so, yeah, no, we, we did. 
I, I'm contracted for somewhere in the neighborhood of about 250 to 300 hours annually. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So we do lots of days, you know, you kind of start in the fall and, and usually it's at least one day a week in the fall. And then by the time after Christmas, we start getting up and running with at least two days a week, generally in the new year. And usually, you know, four, five hour voice sessions and, uh, and just kind of roll with it. Wow. And that we've been doing it and we've been doing it from home since, you know, we figured out the technology, how to do it since pretty much, uh, I'm going to say April of last year. And we worked right through uh, voicing, you know, NHL 21 through until I think the middle of August. And then the game came out and then um, we were up and running within no time to do start um, voicing again. Crazy. Well, we hear your voice every day in my house, man. We play it I'm every day. I'm sorry to hear that. So uh, <laughs> uh, my kids were like, can we ask a question? I'm like, yeah, of course. What, what do you want to so ask good. them? So my youngest, Levi, who is eight. Yeah. Who is your favorite NHL goaltender? Right now? Yeah. Carey Price. Oh. I'm still, I'm still a Carey Price guy. I mean, uh, you know, I'll never forget with. Uh, the world juniors were here in Vancouver in 2006. And in that December in training camp, Carey price was one of the goalies and he had just been drafted fifth overall by the Montreal Canadians and price got cut. That was the year if people remember it was Justin Pogge who stole the show for team Canada here in Vancouver. And so here was, Carrie Price, and I'll never forget sitting in the lobby at the uh, at the Weston um, Bayshore by the uh, waterfront um, out by uh, Coal Harbor. And there was a bunch of the team that had just taken their team pictures. They all kind of had their Team Canada warm ups. And I remember a handful of the kids who had been cut, and Carrie Price was one of them. And I just remember like the kids are all kind of sitting there quietly and, and Price just kind of said it to whoever was within earshot to listen, but he just kind of said, I'm going to come back here next year and I'm going to dominate. Like he just said it so matter of factly, like, you know, basically like, fuck this, this sucks. I'm coming back next year and I'm going to own this thing. And you know what? A year later, we went to Lexan, Sweden. And that was the Carey Price and Jonathan Taves show where he put on, uh, put on a classic. And you look at how his career skyrocketed to where I think there were some people when he got taken fifth overall thinking, man, that's a reach to take a goalie that high in him. And you know what? He went from gold at the World Juniors into later that spring going to the American Hockey League. You think about that as a teenager. And dominates and takes the Hamilton Bulldogs, American Hockey League, the, the Habs farm team to the Calder Cup and they win the championship. So he's got world junior gold and he backstops a pro hockey team to the championship. And then the next season, there he is with the Montreal Canadiens. And here we are in 2021. Like, look, I think the Habs have kind of, you know, been up and down over the last few years. And I get the price hasn't won a cup yet, but I'll tell you what, if the fate of the world is on the line right now and I need a goaltender, I'll take Carey Price as my guy right now. He had an awesome battle last night with Holtby. <laughs> it was great. I didn't think Carey Price would give up five goals, though, as I just pumped the guy's tires. Uh, I, but, I never would have thought that Holtby would give up five goals. But I'll tell you what, the, the way with hockey being back and no exhibition games, it's kind of lent for a little bit of uh, erratic. It's lent for some erratic play. And, you know, when you get out of that structured system sometimes – that's where fun hockey comes from because now it's up and down. It's scrambly. And that's where you start getting goals. So uh, look, it might drive coaches nuts, but as somebody who likes goals, bring it on. Everybody loves goals, man. That three on three has got to be the best. Fucking yes. Hockey, like ever. It's great. It's awesome. What's your take on the fake crowd noise? I hated the concept of it. Same. I, I hated the concept of it, but it actually has won me over in a big way, um, the approach of it. And I think soccer nailed it. 
you know, if you watch some of the European broadcasts, I think they've really done a nice job in terms of blending in some of the crowd chanting and the humming and the applause and, and just, I really think it's been seamless. I think when you look at what they've done with the UFC to not have any crowds and just go in a more intimate setting, I think the UFC has been great. Um, football's been pretty good. You know, I think football's been pretty good. And, and I think the NHL has been all right. It was interesting. The league, and I, I, I don't know the full details of it, but I know that the NHL reached out to the EA Sports NHL broadcast team and to ask for some advice how to approach you know, the NHL's return to play in the bubble in Edmonton and Toronto last year with the crowd noise. And they, tr- and, and I think one of the pieces of advice that the EA sports team had suggested to the NHL is treat it like a neutral site game, right? So treat it as a, you know, a neutral crowd. So anytime there's a goal, everybody's cheering. There's cheers for the crowd, for the home team, the cheers for the away team. You just treat it more a neutral site. And I, I think I'll say this, I've, I've liked it way more than I thought I would when it came to the piped in crowd noise. Cause I, my first thought was, Oh my God, this is terrible. What a cheesy it, idea. It was, it, it totally, I was like, no, I do not like this idea. And you know yeah. what? The more I watched and we've got some, man, we've got some really talented people in this industry. And I think it's really been on display. And I don't know if they've got enough credit for what they've done for the audio technicians and engineers over the last year when it comes to sports and the return to play. Yeah. Yeah. Well said, I, I guess I, I am like coming around yeah. to it, but uh, yeah. man, I tell you, I fucking hated it for the longest of time. The, 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 the theory of it, I hated. Yeah. But the execution of it has been, it's been pleasant for me. I guess what I'm, what I, think that they're missing is that we're never hopefully ever going to have this again in our lifetime and here's a here's a chance where they could have like the ufc done no crowd noise at all and now we can hear the play by plays being created on ice with besser passing to peterson you know what i mean like yeah. there's there's that aspect that we're that they're losing they're they're missing out on something that is unique to what we're doing present day I think a lot of players who thrive on the the energy of a crowd have struggled with this to try to manufacture that adrenaline. Yeah. You know, I look at, you know, I'll tell you one, one in one industry that I feel like has just been, it's been really tough to watch. I'm an old wrestling nerd. I think yeah. we talked about this you, in my last you podcast. Shared a, right? You shared an awesome, uh, Brutus, uh, Brutus the Barber. <laughs> yeah. And, and awesome. so, um, you know, for me watching wrestling when they came back into, I, you know, I never fully appreciated how important fans were for wrestling and to lose that energy of a crowd. I think it's just, it's just taken so much energy. Now they've created the you know, virtual fans and um, to, you know, to set up everybody kind of on zoom and Skype and, and co- connecting that way on these led screens. It's been something, but I think they've really struggled with that. Um, you know, I think to go into on Saturday night, I'm going to go into Rogers arena and cover the Canucks and Habs game. And that'll be the first ga- game that I'll be in watching with no fans. And I'm fascinated to see how it'll be because of my guess is it's going to be just an intense scrimmage or what it'll be. Right. Because there's no fans that are, screaming and cheering right you know, you think you'll hear guys dropping f-bombs and i think partly that's why leagues don't necessarily want to just have that unfettered audio because you know let's face it i mean there's a lot of, Trash know, talking. A lot of yeah i think there's yeah. a lot of talking and man like in the heat of the moment i mean they even think of like a beer league game right i think there's still just your traditional you know you know pucks you know er, pucks in deep uh, but uh, like everything's probably got an f-bomb or you know, a, a shit or, a, you know, or, and then the other stuff that probably, you know, would get a lot of people in some serious trouble now where, you know, I think people are more mindful of their language, but I'm sure there's still a portion of it that that exists out there. And I don't think the leagues want to go down that slope when they're just trying to, you know, minimize the damage and the losses that they've already taken financially, right? Like the NHL, half their revenue comes from fans in the stands. Like they're still a gate driven industry in a lot of ways compared to the TV contracts that the NFL and the NBA get. 
And this is, um, yeah. So I think they're just like, man, we're just trying to hang on and survive and take the revenue that we still have access to with these TV contracts. But, you know, they're losing. I mean, I think the NHL even kind of said, like, the losses that we're incurring right now is in the B, not in the M. Wow. Saturday night, you're you're at the arena. Same night, um, you're a UFC Bellator. You, you're a fight fan, right? Yeah, I enjoy I enjoy the big fight. I, it's it's it's. I feel like the sport is at a point right now where they need more stars. Yeah, it's saturated. There's too many fights. Um, I agree, a hundred percent. They need more stars. Uh, yeah, two, no, I. Two think of the big ones are fighting this weekend. Like, what what's your take on the the McGregor Poirier two? Connor sells, man. You know, he, he sells a lot of fights and he is, I think still the, he's still the gold standard in terms of the name recognition of what mixed martial arts and combat sports are all about. Right. I mean, Connor McGregor is the face of that sport. He may not be the best fighter, but he is the face of that sport that nobody goes out and sells a fight like Connor McGregor, right. To talk shit, and to draw people in to buy pay-per-views and watch, you know, and to buy tickets, whether you want to see him kick ass or you are paying for tickets to see him get his ass kicked, right? And it kind of goes back to the to the notion of, you know, Muhammad Ali. You know, you know, Ali could talk people into a barn, right? Like he could talk people into an arena, you know, by selling fights. And he backed it up. You know, when you think back in the 1960s and early 70s, you know, he wanted to go to heaven. So I took him down in seven. I'm going to knock him out in four rounds. Like, but that sort of stuff. And that's Muhammad Ali, who was influenced by a pro wrestler in the 1950s by the name of Gorgeous George. Right. And so that whole element of theater where, yes, professional wrestling is kind of the, you know, the hijinks and the sports entertainment, but you need to be an entertainer as well in the fight game in order to have an appeal. You know, you look at Floyd Mayweather for that matter, like Floyd Mayweather wasn't necessarily the nicest guy and not necessarily the best human being, but he was a phenomenal fighter and, but he talks shit. Right. And then he'd back it up. And I think that's where the UFC and look, it's really hard to sit there and be a great fighter and then to have that expect somebody to have that personality and go out there and, you know, talk trash or be a hype man and sell the fights. Some guys, you know, less is more. Some people can just be total wrecking machines like a Brock Lesnar and just be an ass kicker, not necessarily a great talker. Conor McGregor is the total package in that. You know, you look at guys in the years past where Chael Sonnen was that guy, right? You know, but you have to win fights too to back it up. You know, Josh, <laughs> Josh Koscheck too. You, they were great talkers, right. but those great talkers have to be able to win fights too. Because if the guy who's talking smack all the time saying, Hancock, you and me in the cage, I'm going to knock you out. And then I go get knocked out that weekend. Well, then I get up the following match, you know, the next time the fight. And it's like, you know what? Next person, I'm going to knock him out in the second round. I'm taking him out. And then I get knocked out again. And so, you know, you get that fatigue that there's a certain point that I think the viewing audience will buy that hype man for, you might have maybe three strikes and you're out, right? You start losing too many fights. Then people have seen you get your ass kicked enough and you're going, "Eh, I'm less inclined to watch that. You know, McGregor got humbled, you know, a couple of years ago but I think there's still enough currency in terms of what he can do that appeals. And, you know, it's a good fight this weekend. Um, You know, I I still struggle sometimes with the politics of the UFC and trying to set up the the fights that people want. Um, It feels like it's starting to kind of stretch into boxing a little bit. Uh, But, you know, I, I just think that one thing about MMA as a whole is that, You know, now you've got different leagues uh, where you've got Bellator, you've got the UFC. Strike force. And, 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 you know, and and you've got these these different outlets, which is great for a fighter. But at the same time, that if you want the best fights, you want the best fighters. And I think still the best talent resides in the UFC. But you you need more, more personalities. Like I go back, man, 10 years ago, you think of the guys that you could rattle off. 
that were right. legitimate main event fights, but you'd get a few of them on a card. Like and you think of the Iceman right. and Randy Couture and the Axe Murderer and GSP and BJ Penn and Brock Lesnar and you know Nick so Diaz many, and the, yeah. the, the Diaz got, brothers have been around for years, but you know you could list off all these different names that were legitimate. You know, Frankie Edgar, like all these names that you can kind of go off one after the other after the other. And a lot of the, that generation is kind of gone. And now you're kind of looking at it and don't get me wrong. I think the, the top end fighters are great fighters, but there's just not enough of them. And there's not enough of them that seem to appeal to a mass audience that say, Hey, you know what? This guy's got personality like John Jones, you know, John Jones should like, is the, is the best fighter in the history of the sport. But how many times have you seen John Jones fight in the last half decade? Well, he's got to stop. He got, using <laughs> well that, well that, and that's a whole other issue where you know his personal demons have gotten the best of him but good looking charismatic good Killer talker fighter. and an uh, incredible yeah. fighter you know to me he should have been the ali in a lot of ways of, of this sport and should have been and, and marketable like man that's a charismatic guy who could sell and unfortunately john jones just cannot get out of his own way and and that's what's unfortunate. I think it's really hurt the sport that, you know, the best athlete in the sports history and the best fighter in the sports history has been maybe the biggest problem in the sports history. Interesting, right? So who takes it? Connor? I'll take Connor. Yeah. I, li I like Connor to win this yeah. one. I think he's, you know, I, I think he's still serious enough about, you know, backing it up. And, and I think the UFC wants to put him in a position to succeed. Look, it's better business for the UFC if Conor McGregor uh, is successful, right? I mean, he sells fights. Like, look at look at the buy rate. Like, it wasn't that long ago. We're talking four years ago where he stepped inside, a uh, you know, a ring, you know, out of his element and fought Floyd Mayweather. And did, you know, was there ever a thought he was really going to win? No, but, but, but Connor went out there and I think anybody who paid for that fight, which was around a hundred bucks, I think everybody kind of walked away and said, you know what? That was fun. Yeah. It was went, entertaning. Like, I got my money's worth. It, yeah, was, right? it, like it, wasn't, went ten, it wasn't yeah. a farce. Yeah. It went 10 rounds. You saw some guys throwing punches. And at the end of the day, you know, what? 4 million people bought that on pay-per-view. Like four million pay per view buys, like it shattered records. Right, and now I, there's talk of uh, Pacquiao, which I think McGregor won't stand a chance. Well, I mean, I, look if you're if you're putting a fighter, if you're putting a boxer in the ring against somebody who's not a boxer, when it comes and and putting them in an actual boxing match, the boxer's going to win. Right. It's, you know, in, in certain elements, like if you put Floyd Mayweather or Manny Pacquiao inside, you know, an octagon. Well, game over. It's it's it. You know, the fighter generally has no chance. Right. You get taken down. You suddenly lose the you're, one ability you're, you're choked one out. You're on your back. Like, what the fuck? That's this it. Happened? Well, and that's it. Then we saw that about 10 years ago. James Tony stepped inside the ring, uh, you know, or James Tony stepped inside the cage to fight Randy Couture. And, right. you know, James, James Tony was, a, you know, hey, he was a world champion boxer. But as soon as he got taken down to the ground, James Tony was not a world champion boxer anymore. He was, you know, he had no there was no punching to be able to be effective when you're on the ground. Right. And so, you know, Couture made short work at James Tony. You go back, there's a, there's a great book that was written in the last couple of years that speaks to uh, about 1976. Uh, it was kind of the, which is kind of deemed as the birth of MMA. There was a, a Japanese company that had reached out to Muhammad Ali and wanted to have an exhibition with um, this world champion wrestler, Antonio Inoki who was basically the Hulk Hogan of Japan. Okay. And they had signed and paid Ali millions of dollars to have this match against Antonio Inoki. And so uh, the deal was done. And then when it kind of came to the night, you know, the promoters wanted Ali to lose to Antonio Inoki, to which Ali was like, I'm not losing this fight. And Inoki <laughs> was like, well, I'm not losing my this fight. And so kind of like all bets were off and they stepped into the ring where Ali had to wear his gloves and they went 15 rounds and Anoki was terrified at the idea of getting punched 
and thought his only shot was to win this thing was to take him to take down Ali, but he didn't want to stand up with him. So for 15 rounds and like, if you, you find this on YouTube, but Anoki basically walked around a ring on like a crab and throwing, throwing kicks and Ali stood up, you know, trying to get this guy to come up. Now, you know, you see how what people do now, you start standing up. Some guy can be a stand up fighter. Some guy might be a wrestler. And, you know, you see what martial, you know, MMA has become now. But for 15 rounds, three minute, 15 rounds, it was a dog's breakfast that people were subjected to ordering this on pay-per-view, watching a guy walk around on his hands and his legs, terrified (laughs) to get punched by the heavyweight champion of the world. And so thankfully it's evolved much more than that for the sport, but they need more personalities, Todd. Right. Yeah. Fair. Oh, my uh, second question. My, uh, my eldest James. Hi James. He wants to know what is your favorite sport? You know, that's a great question, man. I, I mean, I, it's funny. I probably would lean towards, I guess, hockey nowadays. Um, I was such an NFL guy growing up. I mean, I, I, I like to consider myself a sports fan. Um, I guess if you got to pin me down to one, I'll go with hockey, but I, uh, I just love to kind of, I always thought of myself as a well-rounded guy, like, man, the NBA finals, I just, there's nothing better for me. You know, when, when you got two great teams matching up in a seven game series in basketball, Um, I love, there's no team I'm probably more passionate about than the Chicago bears at this stage of my life in the national football league and to go to Chicago and finally as a fan, after all these years to soldier field about a year and a half ago was unbelievable. Um, but I guess I'd probably say hockey. Cool. Uh, well, let's get outside of sports here for a little bit, James. I'm going to wrap this up pretty quick here. I know we've already been on for 45, so already, um, I know, right. Time flies. Um, I'm a talker. So what was the music like in the Sabelski house as a kid growing up? What are your parents playing? What do you, what do you be influenced by as a little tyke? Well, you know, my parents always had 580 CFRA on in the house growing up in Ottawa. And that was just, that was their brand. And we went from listening. It was an all hit station when I was little and it went from all hit radio to oldie station to talk radio but we were kind of an all over the map like my mom loved i mean she kind of loved her pop music and disco um my dad loved his elvis presley and uh motown and my and my older sister she was about six years older than me so kind of early 80s if she was big into mod if you remember that or or new wave uh and punk so i was definitely an all over the map i mean as a kid i i mean I think everybody on the planet loved Michael Jackson as a kid, yeah. but you know, I absolutely love the Motown sound, love the doo-wop. Um, and so definitely there was a lot of, I guess, oldies, the oldie station was definitely large and in charge. So a lot of fifties and sixties, you know, folk country, that sort of, you know, Johnny Cash and Marty Robbins that my dad would always be whistling or Waylon Jennings and, and that sort of element. And then I kind of had the, the influence from my sister who kind of taught me to keep it real with a little bit of uh, adamant um, or madness with our house. And, and somewhere along the way, I, I took, I took my love of Motown and Michael Jackson and what my sister was digging and my parents and, and kind of created my own sort of taste, which is, that eclectic hodgepodge of anything that ranges from public enemy to guns and roses to the Foo Fighters to Kendrick Lamar and to the uh, soundtrack of frozen. Yeah. You were saying the last time, I think you were getting a little bit into jazz. You were saying, yeah, well, you know, I'll tell you what I, I'm a big, I love horns. Same. I like, I, I just, I love horns. And There's a, so pause for, a, second. There, for yeah. a, a local band in Vancouver with horns, check out a band called small town artillery. Fucking great band. Small town artillery. All right. Yeah. All right. I will check them out. Uh, you know, but like Nathaniel Rateliff. Yeah. Great. Um, great and, 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 you know, and, and to see what, uh, like, you know, just bringing in the horns, uh, you know, just, 
love a song that gives me get, gets me hyped. I right, like twenty five or six two four, like you know, from Chicago. Chicago, yeah. You know, boom! Okay. You want to get me fired up? Just give me some horns. And and to this day, if if the kids aren't in the car and it's just Brenda and I driving and I'm just DJing and I'm riding shotgun, like I will drive her fucking bananas because I'm just playing something loud. I'll put some Stevie Wonder on or just something that's got some horns and just, you know, the shimmy shake in the car and, you know, yeah. all of it. That's, uh, yeah. that's totally me. Uh, some harmonies, some harmonizing and some horns. You can't go wrong. Love it. What was your first concert? Maestro Fresh Wes. That's right. You know, I think I did ask you last time about that. The godfather of Canadian hip hop, which all years later to be able to, uh, I, I um, helped organize a charity uh, event in support of um, relief for the Haiti earth, earthquake in 2010. And um, Maestro was part of it. And like totally, you know, I, I, I would consider Stro a friend now. Yeah. Um, or Wes, if you will. <laughs> but, but at the time, like to kind of just like, Oh my God, this is Maestro Fresh West. Like, oh no, you let your backbone slide. West. Oh, I'm like, it, I'm, you're trying to be cool. Like, you're trying to be cool, but, you know, just totally like, oh my God, it's Maestro. And yeah. Um, yeah. So I was definitely, yeah. Um, that was, that was concert number one. That and probably, I think, uh, a live performance of today's special. <laughs> right. If you remember that kids TV series. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that counts as a concert or not. Maybe. I don't think so. Wes is probably your first. Yeah. Okay. Um, what's the most overrated band on the planet? Hmm. Ooh. Um, Oh boy. You know, I mean, Nickelback always feels like the easy answer, right? In a lot of ways, but overrated. Um, you know what? Hmm. You know, there was a long time, I'm going to get killed for this, but there was a time that uh, I wasn't necessarily the biggest hip fanatic. And, you know, there were songs I liked, um, but the way that people were so fanatical about them at times, I was kind of like, eh. And if you go back to 2016, the night they had their final concert and the CBC carried it live, uh, you know, I watched that and, and, you know, halfway through the concert, it kind of hit me that my God, like these guys have been the soundtrack for like the formative years of my life from through high school, through college, you know, into my young professional career. And I just, I teared up, like I had tears streaming down my eyes where I don't think I fully appreciated them until, I was older and I certainly appreciate them now and find myself listening to them way more than I ever did younger. But I think there was a time where I looked at the hip as kind of being those guys. Hmm. Um, you know, I wouldn't say that now, but uh, you know, definitely learn to appreciate, but most overrated. Um, hold on. Let me uh, come back to me on that a minute. Let me, let me, let me, let me, uh, let me have a slow burn on that for a second here. I feel like yeah. there's something there. Yeah. I'll just see if I can come up with a hot take on it. What are you, what are you binge watching lately? Yellowstone right now. I Yellowstone. I heard it's awesome. It is. Yeah. So it's funny because like there's three seasons and I just saw like the previews for this in the last month and uh, finally decided, okay, well, why not give it a try? I guess the best way to describe it is how a lot of people have kind of summed it up to me when I kind of threw it out on Twitter saying, is this worth sticking out with? Um, and people have described it as sons of anarchy on horses. <laughs> so, awesome. so hopefully, so hopefully, hopefully it ends. Hopefully, I mean, Sons of Anarchy kind of just got a little too much for me. After I think a it while. probably could have wrapped up by season four. Yes, totally agree. Instead season of seven. four, yeah, season four would have been just fine. Uh, right. Yeah, so Yellowstone is kind of where I'm at right now, and uh, waiting to dive into season three of Cobra Kai as well as uh, waiting for me. Oh, so are you was... doing that Cobra Kai? I, I oh, it's a, it's and... amazing. You didn't like it. I didn't, I, not enough to watch more than maybe four episodes. Okay. I mean, the one thing is it's an easy watch, right? The each episode's only about 25 minutes. Yeah, they're fast. So, so those yeah, I are... just couldn't do it. I, I mean, I do, I don't know. I, I guess I probably eventually will, but I don't know. I just, mm -hmm. you know, those late nights where you're a little bit high and you're like, that's eh, not fucking really, 
it's not really doing what I was hoping it was yeah. going to do. <laughs> no, I, I, I hear you. Um, Your Honor is supposed to be another one that I want to kind of dive into. That uh, What was yeah, that Brian, chess Brian one? Did you ever watch that chess one? I did not, but I've heard a lot of people kind of d- awesome. dive into that. Yeah. Dude, it was really good, man. It, it was like, I was like, ah, again, hi. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, you know, I'll try this out. First up, it's like, wow, man, this is really good. Really well acted. Really well mm-hmm. written. There was uh, the, the series that uh, the two series that Brenda and I kind of really dove into in the last year in the fall, we, we got into the boys. Yeah. Which is like a real dark superhero series. Great where, show. If nobody's yeah. seen that, like who get on yeah. that. That's it's aggressive. Um, and if you don't like gore, then maybe not. Um, and the other one was, uh, there's a Netflix series called the last kingdom that yeah. uh that it's basically you know if, if you're if you're a big game of thrones fan it's it's light on the fantasy element but if you like you know swords and knights and all that sort of stuff it's it moves at a much faster pace than uh, game of thrones where you know there's lots of there's lots of fighting lots of battling um but we've kind of enjoyed that uh, that series for the for Did you get into uh seasons. vikings you know what? We haven't. My mom's big into uh, Vikings, um, Good. but I, you know, and I've heard nothing but wonderful things about it, but I have not, uh, I have not done Vikings yet. So put it on the, uh, add it to the list. Do it, yeah. Um, are you a fan of all the, the superhero movies that get made? X-Men Amazing. And- uh, you know what? I, I am. I'm, I'm a huge Marvel cinematic universe. Uh, the movies that they have done have been phenomenal um i absolutely have loved them and i'm ready to kind of dive into uh wandavision i think we'll we'll start next week on that um but i that is some trippy ass shit dude yeah that's what i've that's what i've heard it's uh it's a different but you know like the one thing that like marvel hasn't fucked it up at all when it comes to uh movies and i'm i'm a dc guy at heart like i'm a batman guy like my first word as a kid was batman yeah. And, you know, I, I, I just the expectations for for, you know, are always so high when there's a Batman movie coming out. And, you know, they started off pretty good with, the you know, the Michael Keaton movies. And then they just totally ruined that franchise by the end. And, you know, the nipples on the costume and like, what are you doing? The Val Kilmer and George Clooney ones. And, yeah. You know, they, then Christopher Nolan absolutely nailed it with the trilogy there with the Dark Knights. Um, but man, you look at how many times a DC is kind of missed on stuff, like what they did with suicide squad. It's like, God, man, really? And even justice league, it was like, it was okay, but man, it could have been so much, so much better. You know, I feel like they've got something going here with wonder woman. Um, I didn't love the follow up here that I just watched over the Christmas holidays. Uh, the uh, 1984. Yeah, it was just it was two and a half hours. It did. You know what? It, I haven't it, seen it yet. It, it doesn't need to be two and a half hours. You could have shaved easily 45 minutes off from it. Um, mm. But you know, um, but there's something there with that franchise. I actually thought here. You know, I thought Ben Affleck was fantastic as Batman, but they, you know, we'll see where they ultimately go with the whole this the Snyder the Snyder cut of Justice League but you compare DC and how they've handled things from a film standpoint and Marvel and how they've handled things I mean Marvel if you go back you know there's a great story I it was just shared to me recently from a comic book shop owner that it wasn't that long ago that at one point Marvel was losing so much money they put Iron Man on the block they put Iron Man up the character for sale. And it was about, I think they were asking somewhere about 800,000 to a million dollars at the time. And this is like within the last 20 years. Hmm. And I remember, and the story goes like, I remember this, this comic box, this comic book shop owner saying that, you know, there were a few of us that kind of got together and networked and like, Hey, can we raise enough capital to buy this and see what we can do with it and, and see what we can do. Now, Marvel ultimately chose not to sell. Right. And look at now that wisely, but right and wisely, and where Robert Downey Jr. essentially turned essentially uh, maybe a B, B minus Marvel character into an A lister and probably up there in the conversation with Spider Man now in terms of their popular franchise sure. characters for Marvel superheroes, right? Like that's 100, dude, 100%. Like without, yeah. without John Favreau's 
Iron Man, mm-hmm. they don't have that bar. Like totally, dude, th- that movie is like still today, present day. Yeah, one of the best Marvel films ever made. That the 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 significance. I mean, to what Robert Downey Jr. did for that character for Tony Stark and Iron Man. Uh, I don't think. I mean, he gets a lot of credit. He was paid handsomely, but I still don't think he gets enough credit for the impact because if Iron Man bombs, I don't know if they have as many of these films going forward. But, you know, Tony Stark, you know, Robert Downey Jr. and Iron Man, they had a home run with the first one. And that leads to what? Captain America and Thor and then the first Avengers and you know, you get an Ant-Man and then what they did with Guardians of the Galaxy. And I mean, like you talk about like D-list characters right. and they turned Ooh. it into the biggest blockbuster of the summer a few years ago and they got a sequel out of it. It's it's unbelievable how they've woven that story through 23 movies or 22 movies. Uh, it's incredible. And honestly, you'd be hard pressed to sit there. Like You can say, I like this movie better than that one. And this was OK, but they hit a home run like absolutely nailed pretty much all of them all of them like you kind of walked away from every movie going man that was great like the first avengers movie to wait for that and the build-up and like to hit that home run like wow i mean you know to compare it to like the you know end game you know it's you know tough to compare now but like that first time you saw Iron Man and Hulk and Thor and Black Widow and Cap and Hawkeye all kind of ready to go. And you're like, all right. I mean, to nail that and then to all these, you know, to the, to get to that finale, to what everybody's been waiting for and to nail that finale, that Avengers Endgame. Like I put it on the other night just to watch and just like, you know, Cap Avengers Assemble. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, I, I'm like, I'm, why am I? I've watched it probably like ten times now. And my eyes water. I'm like, yeah, go get them. You know, yeah. like I, I watched oh. Iron Man the other night and was like, fuck yeah, this movie's just so badass, man. It's just the best. <laughs> like those two scenes in the last, you know, in the last few years, like the Mandalorian finale is season two here. Yeah, dead. Uh, I mean, going, man. I won't spoil it for anybody who hasn't seen it, but like that and and the end of Endgame. Oh, like, so you know, good. there's anticipation and there's hype. And you, when, it, when it actually delivers, you're just like, yeah. <laughs> and what did you think when they announced that uh, Robert Pattinson was going to play uh, Batman? Well, I never read the Twilight books. Um, and so my first thought was like, oh, boy, Team Edward, really? Or whatever. And, um, but, man, I, I it works, you know, to kind of see how. Uh, you know, he looks at, you know, to me, I think an important element to wearing the cowl is you need to have a bit of the jaw, right? Like yeah. I'm a little, like, I got a little bit of a turkey neck here. So like, I, I just couldn't pull off Batman. Right. And I recognize that early. I just don't have that square jaw, which is why I got a little so, bit. Of so you won't be auditioning of, for that, but you will be for the pirates of the Caribbean. That's it. I'll be a great uh, Jack Sparrow stand in or stunt double to get blown right. up in a ship. But, uh, but no, I think, from what I've seen from Pattinson and from the trailer, he looks legit. Man. It looks pretty good. Like, right? like I, I, I look, I always look at Ben Affleck as the guy from mall rats. Do you remember that movie? Mall rats. Great movie. Yeah. And, but like Kevin Affleck's Smith. character, he yeah. plays like the biggest D bag, right? Just a total. And, douche. <laughs> it's a total. And, and so it's always tough to kind of shake that. It's like Bradley Cooper. I still, no matter how good and man, he was great in the star is born, but Bradley Cooper to me is still the guy from the wedding crashers, right? Like just that, yeah. that total D bag, right? You yeah. just kind of think that, you know, there's probably, you know, an extension of his personality that kind of just lends for that dude to be a bit of a dick. And so, which makes him a great actor. But Affleck, as much as I cringed when I saw him being cast as Batman initially, I thought, man, how do you like, how do you go with that guy? And I thought he was, you know what? I might say like, he might be the best Bruce Wayne and Bale killed it. Right. Bale's I didn't love his voice. Ba- like Bale. The only thing I didn't like, was I, didn't like that. What is I just that? didn't like the fact that he wanted to tell everybody to smarten up like that. But I, know, I like, thought, why is yeah, that? Why? but, but you know what? Grizzled Batman, uh, uh, Ben Affleck. I thought he nailed it. I think Pattinson's going to be all right. I think he's obviously a little prettier cause he's, he's younger, but I think, 
I think Pattinson's got a chance to hit a real home run here. I, I'm, I'm very optimistic. I, I yeah. felt like I was always judging, like Michael Keaton, as good as he was, I didn't feel like Keaton had the job. I think that's important. Yeah. What superpower would you want to have? Oh, man, flight feels like a tough one to beat. Teleportation? Mm. Time travel? Time travel, yeah. I, you know what? As somebody who's a big fan of history, um, I would love to kind of experience some of that. Where would you go? I, for, where would you want to go mm, first time? Oh, wow. Where would I want to go? Um, right? Like, how fucking rad would that be to go to, I don't know, yeah. go to the, like the 1800s? Well, that's it, man. Like, to kind of, I mean, honestly, to, to see, you know, th- that I look at like this country and go 150 years ago as this country has taken shape um you know kind of the period around the civil war in america and just man it's just a fascinating time that ultimately in the backdrop kind of 1860s where this country gets settled um See, i mean i think walking the, down the fucking street <laughs> well i mean you know what i'll tell you what man like I, i'm a, i love the stories of i like i love a good western movie and i mean to kind of experience what like the wild west would have been like some of those towns but the reality is is Man, just the volatility. Like we talk about how people behave now. Like, you think about, you know, you could you get in a disagreement, you get shot, hey, right? What, like, what did you just say to me? <laughs> hey, were you cheating in cards? Bang, oh. you know, like, but you know, and, and then the bad, the great thing is, is how many people had bad shots, right? It's just like, you know, it's all these stories of these generals or outlaws that just had like five to 10 bullet wounds. And, you know, you didn't exactly have the medical care that we do now and live to tell, Oh, I got a graze here in my shoulder. I got one in my hip, one in my leg. And um, yeah, I think the 1860s would be kind of, I'd be, I'd be down with checking out. Um, I'd love to go check out like the medieval times as well. Um, and just to kind of go, you know, kind of, you know, Saxon England and, um, to see that. And, and I'll tell you this, like as a kid who was raised Catholic, um, I, I don't, not exactly one that practices and haven't for a long time, but man, I think like going back to the Middle East and or going to Jerusalem and Bethlehem or kind of all that history you kind of heard about as a kid and and maybe kind of get a clarification on what's fact and what's fiction, you know? Yep. <laughs> you know, like, you know, okay, yep. all these, you know, certain people were talking about and like, okay, were they legit? Like, where can I find this guy? And right. You know, and, and what's his address just, again? Right. Okay. I'll yeah. Like, you know, where's that carpenter? And, uh, yeah. you know, where's that, where's that Virgin Mary? And, uh, <laughs> you know, so, you know, just to maybe see if, uh, yeah, just to kind of, yeah, just get some clarification, you know, for the I department of clarification. It would want to scratch that itch. You know? Yeah. Like, okay. Bit, where, sure. Yeah. Where, where's, where's Noah live? You know, where, where, where do you park that ark? You know? And uh, so See how big that ark is. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, if you're getting two of every animal in there, that's gotta be a yeah, big motherfucking boat. Pretty big ark. <laughs> All right, James, let's wrap it up. What's the most overrated band on the planet? Uh, let's say. Hold on. It's coming to me. It's coming to me. I feel like uh, mm, the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hate mail is coming your way, buddy. I don't know, man. Like just the simplicity, like there's some really beautiful songs, you know, in the later years, but and the simplicity of some of those songs, are they really that good? <laughs> James is easy to find on social media to bag on <laughs> simply his name <laughs> it's great to see you buddy let's make this beers uh you know when the covid takes a takes a hike yeah for sure man uh, you know what i think long. the encouraging thing that uh has been is to hear that at least four people i know uh with their family and uh people in the neighborhood that have been vaccinated so at least it's it's happening and to know that okay there's people i know that it's actually so it's you know, it's the steps it's are taken. Yeah, it, it's happening. Yeah. And I'm sure we'd all like for it to be a lot faster than it is, but it's it's happening. And that's the step in the right direction. But yes, it has been way too long. And thanks for letting me fill up your airwaves, buddy. Always, man. Okay, bud. We'll see you online. And uh, thanks again for doing this. Peace and love, buddy. Stay yeah. safe out there. Take care, James. Bye, handsome. Okay, bye. 
the Toddcast Podcast on ToddHancock.ca. Listening to a podcast should be time well spent, and I promise it will be if you'll give this podcast a try. It's called Something You Should Know. I'm the host, Mike Carruthers, and in every episode, I talk with leading experts on topics I know you will find fascinating. From why people can't keep secrets, what your favorite music says about you, why your pet acts in strange ways, and so much more. Something You Should Know is designed to give you information you can use in your life and give you great intel that you can share with others. I'm told it's a binge-worthy podcast. And with over a thousand episodes, there's a lot to binge on. Something You Should Know has been ranked in the top of the Apple podcast charts consistently for a long time. I know you're going to like this. I just need to get you to try it. Something You Should Know. It's available wherever you listen to podcasts. Hi, I'm Jennifer, a founder of the Go Kid Go Network. At Go Kid Go, putting kids first is at the heart of every show that we produce. That's why we're so excited to introduce a brand new show to our network called The Search for the Silver Lining, a fantasy adventure series about a spirited young girl named Isla who time travels to the mythical land of Camelot. Look for The Search for the Silver Lining on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. What's up, everyone? It's Noah Daniels. Hey, y'all. I'm JJ. Hey, guys. It's Kat. We're your hosts of the Real Hauntings Podcast. We bring on guests who share their firsthand encounter ghost stories and supernatural experiences. Now on to the trailer. I've been warned to not tell this story, but I think because of the way it ends, it's okay to tell this story. Because some people say that with certain entities, to like speak of them or talk about them or in any way like portray them as powerful will attract them to other people. The creepiest thing about it to me is a lot of times it would wait for me to notice it. Like it would just lay its arm out like this and then I'd be like, where is it? Where is it? And then I'd see it and then it would just slither back. For more information on the Real Hauntings, Real Ghost Stories podcast, make sure you check out real.fm to learn more about our podcast and many other amazing podcasts.